Okay, welcome to the Spotlight with Sean O'Rourke. Today I'm going to be talking with my good friend that I've known since I'm like 16 years old. Uh, Stu works in the film industry. We've worked on a ton of projects together, and uh, here we go. You know, it's funny. We both just finished watching Extraction. Um, and, you know, it's funny. I was sitting down, getting ready to watch it, pulled up the Netflix, and I get a text from you. And you were like, um, I, I just started Extraction, and it said, it said minute, message delivered one minute ago. Yeah. And and I had I had hit play and we basically kind of watched it together. Yeah. And um, uh, I really liked it. It was good, man. It it felt like a, a summer blockbuster movie to me when I watched it. Can you imagine if that got released on the big screen and not straight to Netflix? I mean, the action in it was I would say it reminded me a lot of Winter Soldier, except if you took Captain America out and made it R rated. And you had this badass mercenary in it. Like, that's the movie. And the action was on yeah. par with Winter Soldier, as far as I'm concerned. Like, I don't know. What did you think? Well, I thought it was good. And I noticed in the credits that um, one of the Russo brothers helped write the script. Right. And I saw that Chris Hemsworth produced the film. Well, the, the, the brothers, or they produced it. They, I know. I noticed. I thought they directed it, but they didn't. But they no. did. One of them wrote it, and they both produced it, along with Chris and, Hemsworth. Along with Chris Hemsworth, and I thought to myself, "Damn, I didn't realize he had that kind of street cred. That now he's he can produce films. Um, I mean, but you know, you do enough Thor, and you're bringing in billions of dollars for the the Mouse House. Um, I guess you know you you're able to start doing those I, kind of things. See, for me, every time they do that, I it I automatically think they're trying to give them a bigger payday because they know they've got this amount budgeted for actors. But you know, when it comes to executive producers, like that's the sneaky way for them to give them more money because you see it on TV all the time, right? Where you'll have the main characters, and then next thing you know, you start seeing them in the executive producer credits, and that's so they can give them a higher paycheck. Which is yeah. totally cool. Like now the producers they get in a whole different pay scale and they're double dipping and that's awesome. So I feel like with And then their resi their residuals are different. Right. And I feel like with yeah. Chris Hemsworth, if you're gonna get him and he's kinda at the pinnacle after Endgame, you know, he's like, This is as big as he's gonna be. Not saying he couldn't be bigger, and but I mean as far as like blockbuster movie type of thing, it's gonna be hard to ever top Endgame, you know, and be a part of a franchise like that. And he's still in it too so it's like i feel like for them to attract him to netflix they had to probably be like all right this is as much as we can pay you as an actor but we'll give you an executive producer credit and boom we can pay you this on top of it so yeah i think well i mean i if that's how they're gonna make money and that's how they have to create these revenue streams they're that's that's it's i mean they've been doing it for years it's old hat you know yeah yeah and uh it's and it's it's a lot a lot a lot i remember when um you know, uh, a lot of times when they know it's the end season of a show, uh, they'll let the actors direct some episodes right. because a lot of them know that their careers probably aren't going to go anywhere on a television show afterwards so that they go right into the directing thing and they start directing television and they're constantly directing television. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I get it. I get it now. The, the movie had a lot of action. The fights choreography was great. And when I say yeah. choreography, I don't mean like uh, perfect, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. It was very like grudge match throwing down, slamming people's heads into doors. I mean, some of the stuff like like even in the preview when the guy gets thrown through the the broken wall and his face hits the top of the wall and he flips down. That was in the preview <laughs> yeah. for it. Um, a lot of original creative stuff. You know, after he got hit by a car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just thought to myself, and then the other guy who was kind of a bad guy, but not really a bad right. guy, uh, gets hit by a car by him, by the truck. Right. And they still kept getting up. And I just, I just was like the internal bleeding. It reminded me of, to a, it reminded me of John wick. Like a lot of that fighting was on par right. with John wick, I would say, but not as much martial arts. Yeah, I mean, it was more brute force 
semi-realistic, I guess, where you yeah. would imagine it wouldn't look like The Matrix or something well choreographed or anything like that. It would be more raw and gritty. So, yeah, yeah, I I liked it. I thought it was good. Um, I, and you know, they they kind of set it up for a sequel. Yeah, I like I but like what, how they, But what's but what's he gonna do with the little uh, the Indian guy? What's he gonna do with this kid? Like, well, is. What I do, what I did, and I did want to talk about this, this is more on the business side of Netflix and where I do think this is insanely smart on their behalf, because I think the one reason why that would be a hard sell in America is because it was mostly in India with an Indian cast. Right. Right. You know, so, and I, I'm, I'm thinking, I don't know, and I, you know, I don't really follow, uh, Bollywood or, you know, uh, Indian cinema, but. I have a feeling that the people that were in it were probably big stars in India. I'm just guessing. Oh, I'm sure. I'm and sure. So yeah. You bring that massive. I mean, what they're the number two country or is population size in the world. You know. Yeah. Behind next China. to China. Right. Yep. So it's like that's a huge audience. So you have their movie stars with one of America's and Australia's biggest movie stars right now, and you have yeah. them in a movie. Like that's just marketing gold from, uh, especially well, if you're I a global company. And I, yeah, and, I, and that's the key right there is global because, you know, Netflix, uh, they've kind of topped out with subscribers in the U.S. They're, they're only looking to pilfer new countries right. uh, as far as viewers. So it makes total sense. And you saw that when uh, they did the Michael Bay movie. Um, Six Underground. Uh, Six Underground yeah. was the same way. They, you know, they're putting people on the posters from different continents because Netflix does not look towards the U S as it's only cash cow when right. it comes to stars, it, it's looking globally. And that's the smart play because that's the only way Netflix will continue to grow. Yeah. I think, and again, like, I don't know if that movie, even though it was awesome, would play well in America because of mostly being in India with an Indian cast, like not saying America is closed minded in that regard, but I just don't know if it would have that appeal, but on Netflix, it's like, it's perfect. And I do feel with everyone kind of jumping into streaming and then after the whole COVID thing with the movie theaters and they're finding that they can still make money by, you know, video on demand that you might start seeing them making more movies like the, this Netflix movie. Cause I feel like that's going to be the future. Yeah. Well, speaking of movies on demand and, <clears throat> and all that, you know, it Marvel's entire slate was just pushed to next year. Yeah. They pushed it all. And I thought to myself, and the first one out of the gate is going to be Black Widow. Yeah. And I thought to myself, this is a win because it was originally slated to come out in March, I believe, right? Or March or April. What, which was it? I think it was actually May, wasn't it? Or end of was it? April. It was late April or early May. See, my thinking was, I, you know, I had, I have my worries that Black Widow wouldn't do the box office that some of the other uh, characters, you know, which is why in many respects they held off on doing a standalone with Black Widow forever because nobody knew if anyone would go see it. And they, they even said that. I mean, come on. The figures don't sell as well. And that's just how it is. Right. Um, and, but I'm thinking if this is the first one out of the gate when everybody is allowed to get back to the theaters, the box office for Black Widow is going to be huge. Yeah. And I think I think you're looking at probably um, uh, Captain Marvel numbers because you know it's a you know sort of a solo film, but you know where that one just happened to be smartly placed in between a major cliffhanger between two films. Uh, this one, I mean, Black Widow's been with it since Iron Man two, so she's been there almost yeah. since the beginning. So she has enough, I do think, of an audience draw. And then the way she ended in, you know, Infinity War. People want to see more because right. she's gone and she's never going to be back again. Right. So I do think yeah. you're right. I think, and that's like the perfect storm. If it's one of the first, you know, mo big blockbuster movies after this whole crisis is over, it's going to go nuts at the theater, I imagine. Yeah, I think so. And, um, <clears throat> you know, and to see them push all of the films down the road is like, ah. Uh, but you know what? Better be safe than sorry. And speaking of COVID-19 and all that stuff, I just I needed to do a shout out to Warner Brothers. Uh, uh, I was working on a Warner Brothers TV pilot. Uh, we got, I don't know, I think it was five or six days into filming. Um, 
and the show shut down, and so did all the other shows across the globe. Right. And out of nowhere, uh, Warner Brothers broke off uh, two weeks' worth of salary um, uh, for all the crew members. So I got a random check in the mail, wow. which I thought was great. And it was, you know, it was a reduced rate, you know, because right. normally I work 60 or 70 hours a week. This was uh, for 40 hours for two weeks. So it was 80 hours. Right. <clears throat> and it was a discretionary relief check is what Warner Brothers called it. And I thought to myself, dude, I got to give them mad props because they didn't have to do that. And, yeah. um, you know, uh, we're, we were really hoping with this pilot that we were going to go, go to series. I mean, that's all they kept talking about when we were shooting this thing. And, um, uh, but I just, I just have to do a shout out to Warner brothers. Cause I, you know, I, I come down on Warner brothers a lot, <laughs> but, but I've worked for Warner brothers a lot. Right. I've right. done a lot of Warner brothers movies. Um, well, I would say it's and, not and that you come shows. down on Warner mm. Brothers per se. More well, I come DC. down on the DC, the right. DC cinematic universe. Yeah, I come down on them uh, just from for creative decisions. But uh, right. but I yeah, I've worked quite a bit for Warner Brothers. I think the first Warner Brothers project I did was in 2006, and I've done quite a bit. Yeah. So, even as an actor. Yeah. Worked for Warner Brothers as an actor, and uh, but mostly crew, behind the scenes. So um, thank you, Warner Brothers, for looking out for the little guy, and taking care of uh, all the crew. And and, and that being said, uh, I have to say, um, the Mandalorian. We we we've talked about the Mandalorian before quite yeah. a bit, and one of the things that we discussed and you can elaborate on this, is that how kind of ill-prepared Disney Plus was when they launched? Go ahead. Oh, no, I was disagreeing with you, yeah. Disagreeing? No, I wasn't. You're talking about how Disney Plus wasn't prepared? Yeah, they weren't oh, prepared. yeah, no. Uh, sorry, I thought you were leading into something. But no, because, yeah, you know, I, that's my big beef with Disney Plus. I said that after the first like month of having it. I was like looking at their slate. And after Mandalorian ended, there was nothing for nothing, like nothing. Nothing. Uh, yeah. Initially, it was the fall of 2020, and that was you know the the Falcon and Winter Soldier. So it's like, what? Why would you launch a service? I mean, I get you have this massive library of stuff we've already seen, but like, how are you not like rush like having at least a few series planned or for? Because you knew the Mandalorian was going to be big. I mean, oh yeah, yeah. You know. They they knew that was going to be big. They and they launched with a lot of original movies. They had the right. uh, the they had the Christmas movie Noel. Uh, yeah. Noel. They had uh, Lady and the Tramp. Right. Um, and they've got a lot of things going. They got the Jeff. Was it, is it the Jeff Goldblum? Is that on Disney? Yeah, Plus? yeah, That's yeah. I watched that. I watched that yeah. whole series. Jesus, I <laughs> you know I thought that. Um, Jeff Goldblum put on that persona, but no, he really is That's that him. guy in real life. Yeah. And he's, he, he's, a, he's a little, a little off. Yeah. He's quirky. I mean, he's he, quirky. Yeah. Uh, eccentric, uh, I think is a better word. He's eccentric. Ex I think eccentric. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And to see the clothes he wears and the things that he does and the way he talks and he uses his hands and he, it's just like, anyway, I enjoyed that as yeah. far as, but I did burn through a lot of everything, but you know, I have a baby. Mm -hmm. uh, a five month old baby. She's five months old now. And so, you know, we were watching Moana. I'm holding her in my arms. Yeah. To, she's just looking at the colors. Cause yeah. she doesn't understand. She's a baby. She doesn't understand it. But, you know, I was able to see all Pixar movies that I had not seen. Yeah. And I still, uh, Toy Story four is on there now. I still haven't watched it yet. Cause I'm trying to find time with the wife, uh, to sit and watch Toy Story four. Um, cause they always make me cry. Those damn movies. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, and I don't know how you top three. The last one was just when the kid played with the little kid and he passed the toys on yeah, to the yeah. little kid. And, uh, I was just <laughs> lumping my throat <laughs> and everything. And um, so yeah, but but yeah, so they weren't prepared. But now Disney says, guess what's coming out soon is the Mandalorian docu series, and th that was the oh shit, we've got to get something thrown together here. Get these people together in a round table. You know, we'll do a whole thing yeah. with the actors, do a whole thing with the producers, do a whole thing with, you know, get Dave yeah, Filoni and get John Favreau and all these people together. 
And then we've got all this really cool tech that we use to shot, shoot the series. Let's show everybody all the, let's pull that the curtain. That still blows my show mind. Show the guy behind the, yeah, go ahead. Talk about that. No, I mean, I just think that behind the scenes that they, because they released that video on YouTube, I'd say about three weeks ago, maybe a month ago, showing how they did, they shot Mandalorian. And that was insane. Like, I cannot, yeah. I, because when, when I watched you, that, I would have never have known that unless they said that. Cause at no point did I ever, that looks like green screen. That looks fake. It all, what I really dug about Mandalorian was it did feel like it was all shot practical. So I was like, well, digging there, that. there's, there's a website called, uh, the making of star wars.com. I think it is. And they were showing how, um, the Mandalorian was shooting a lot in San Diego. Mm -hmm. And I kept going, where in San Diego can you <laughs> shoot stuff? Uh, and that's because they were shooting inside these with these digital screens around them. Right. And, you know, you got a little taste of that, um, instead of doing compositing, like when you saw the behind the scenes of the force awakens where they had the millennium Falcon and they would have the light speed and everything yeah. on a giant screen. So you don't have to composite. Right. Oh my God. Talk about saving render time, saving all that uh, time and labor, um, and it was a natural progression to take that same technology and they're using real engine right. to do it so that as they walk through the, uh, the atmosphere, uh, uh, the set, the set moves with them. Right. Uh, and, and unbelievable tech. Yeah. The real time ray tracing is the game changer. Like when they were able to do that, that changed everything. Cause then now they can do photorealistic backgrounds real time and change them on the fly. I think it's tied the camera, the physical camera is tied into the digital camera. So whatever move it makes, the background reflects as if it was really in the digital world. So the screen is changing as they're moving, doing dolly shots. It's insane. And it looks well, think of, so good. It, it looks so good. Now, in the in the original Mandalorian, the first episode, I did notice uh you know, your 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 screen is rectangle mm -hmm. and i did notice in the corners it would concave a little like bit and yet a little yeah. the, the the image yeah uh and so but i'm i'm sure they fixed that as they went along um with the stitching process but when you think about when you hear stories about uh when terrence stamp did uh the phantom menace no was it the phantom menace or which one was terrence stamp in he was in the phantom menace yeah because that's when the Supreme Chancellor Palpatine took over. One of the reasons why he took the film, he did the film, was because Natalie Portman was in it. He had seen Natalie Portman in The Professional. He loved her. It was an opportunity for her to him to work with her as Queen Amidala, blah, blah. And he was like the only guy, I think, that got a script, a full script, because he said, I'm not doing the movie until I can read the whole script, because they were only sending the sides for the actors. Right. And he was like, no, I'm not doing this thing. How are you going to tell General Zod no? <laughs> right. So so Lucas reluctantly, you know, they sent him a full script. And he's like, oh, my God, I get to work with Natalie Port Portman. And he shows up, and there's a stick with a tennis ball <laughs> there. Right. And he had to talk. At, and and you can see in his performance, he was so bitter about the whole experience, from what I understand, because he's just wrapped in a big green air green screen right he's supposed to talk to people he doesn't know who's down there if anakin's down there little jake lloyd you know and it it all he just came across very stiff like a board right because you can't see anything yeah right he, take out the whole idea that that the actress wasn't there which was a big faux pas i think on on lucasfilm and george back then but if that's the story that Hollywood has heard, I don't know right. if it's the story. I'm not. I'm not going to say that's the truth. But now you get actors that can go into a room and there is no green screen. Right. There, there's still some on set when because I've noticed behind the scenes pictures of the Mandalorian. But but when you can get and see those elements and you can put on, put binoculars up to your face and you see mountains in the distance. That's actors need that. Oh, we yeah. need that. I mean, it's one thing to imagine a green in a big room. It's green and there's a creature over here and he's hairy and there's a yeah. cliff over here. Look down and be scared. But now you can actually do those things in real time. And it's such a tool to get better performances out of actors that to me as an actor, that is the bonus there. Well, I mean, 
that for sure. I mean, because if you, I remember watching the behind the scenes for the prequels, and they even say in the behind the scenes, like how it's a little weird because, you know, it's all green screen and we're told to look at a tennis ball and it's, oh, it's something big and scary or this thing's coming here. And they're like, okay. Yeah. And I get it. Like, that's it. And that movie does feel very artificial. Wooden. Yeah. Wooden. It's Wooden. stiff and like you get the, the performance. The acting are, is very stiff. Yeah. And so I get that and i and that's what was so i think off about it and it worked because it was like a prequel but compared to the original trilogy i mean that was all obviously practical and it's just so good looking the way it was lit and like that's the thing it just had this the the look of star wars just had its own character and then you lost that in the prequels which worked because it was a different time period where everything i guess was more polished but I that's what I loved about the Force Awakens was it felt like a return to that sort of style and I think with this technology that's going to make a comeback in a huge way and what's uh, I think the big thing this is going to be huge on television because they're not going to have to do they do the render for the the background and everything but what was crazy is they're not even lighting they're using the lights that are built into it into it yeah so for tv this is a game changer because you could shoot you know a compress on a what is it like a normal one hour show is eight days like eight shoot days for like i know on one tree i believe they were eight days or six days yeah Maybe i think what we did well i just finished doing reprisal and those were for hulu and those we we shot 12 to 12 days an episode. Wow, you're 12? doing twelve days per episode. I think I think twelve days per episode, if I'm not mistaken. But who, and that was Hulu, right? So that's more. That like was Hulu, and, and then and then and then the the Warner Brothers pilot we were on that was a 14 day shoot. But normally pilots they shoot a little, a little bit longer. more, yeah, a little longer. Um, but but most of the time it's like a nine or ten day. Uh, if it's if it's a teeny bopper television show that that has people just going to high school, that's yeah, a ten yeah. day show. If you got I could a show be wrong. like. But I felt like they were when I. It felt like we were shooting episodes eight day. Like we would shoot an episode and every eight days, and then they would you'd see a new director come in that was prepping that prior eight days or whatever. So yeah, so on I guess a show like that. But even on more ambitious shows, like can you think about that? You could have a room designing a computer. You don't have to light anything. You just go in and the actors just do it. You know, I mean, you got to don't tell that to the it. gaffer. <laughs> yeah, that's going to. Well, I did notice on the stage they do have some lights here and there that. Yeah, they're the still going to need. They're still going to need, you know, crew. But that whole crazy pre-rigging. Those are the guys that are going to get screwed is the pre-riggers. You know, well, like, but to, but uh, but these guys will they'll evolve and learn right. how to pre-rig those screens. Yeah. I mean, that that's because I mean, I know a lot of people that were loaders. Yeah. In the film industry, you know, DIT camera now. department. Yeah. And now they're doing DITs because and they had to go from learning how to change film out in a in a black satin bag in canisters right. yeah, so yeah. you don't expose it. You know, we're talking practical, like physical things to doing everything on a computer and having hard drives come to you and then you transfer and then uplink the the stuff for the sometimes the colorists are on set and they can right. color correct the footage or or at least get the um what the look is going to be and then you know uh it used to be that they would they would FedEx the the G raid uh drives uh to wherever they're doing the post wow um and now i think and i remember back in 2006 they were still when we were shooting 35 millimeter uh on this one Warner Brothers movie they were still shipping it and this is how they did it. So they'd shoot up, they'd shoot the movie, they get the film, they put it in a box, right? And then that box is because it can't go through X-rays. I know what a nightmare. They would, they literally would buy a seat. Oh, really? On the airplane <laughs> and put the box of film like in first class or wherever it went. It never went in the cargo hold. No, sh no, nothing like that. Oh, really? They bought a seat. And That's they strapped crazy. it in. And so, and then there was a courier waiting when the plane landed to get it. And then the courier would take it in the car and go to the post house for them to develop the film. That's how they did it for decades. That's crazy. And now you just do it through the cloud. Yeah. You up, you upload footage. Yeah. Yeah. You get, you get one of these massive, uh, you know, 
transfer rates and boom, you're, you know, it's just crazy how things have changed. And that's just since 2006. Yeah. Yeah. It's right. Well, it was interesting watching everything, you know, changing from film to digital. And then it's really when the Ari Alexa showed up, that's when everyone just started switching. I mean, the red kind of changed the game to an extent, but you didn't really see too many real productions taking chances with it yet. You know, a lot of, you know, why, you know, why the reason why, that that was that happened that way is uh they needed a company like Aerie that already made cinema oh, yeah. cameras where all the buttons were in the right spot yeah just like the other uh film cameras because I'll tell you a story I remember uh when One Tree Hill I think they were in season 7 or 8 um and the they a red camera was delivered to set so that they could figure out because what they were trying to do was cut costs. So I, towards the end of the show, they had gotten rid of Chad, Michael Murray and, um, uh, the other lead actress that was on the show because they were costing Hillary Burton, uh, Hillary Burton. Like they were like 140,000 an episode or something like that. So in order for them to keep going and make a couple more seasons, they had to cut costs. So they lost the two leads and then they were trying to figure out because they were shooting 16 millimeter, if they could go to digital, Right. And so a red camera was brought out to set. And I remember hearing a story. I could be wrong. Uh, if Peter Kowalski hears this, he can correct me on it. Uh, if he's out there, he's a cinematographer. But they couldn't figure out how to turn the camera on. Oh, wow. Right? Because the, the no one no one was there. Right. Right? To, to, to help them. The camera was delivered from the, the camera house. But uh, somebody could have been there. But, like, they couldn't figure out how to get it. And the learning curve was too much when they were trying to go, this was during mid season. They were trying to do camera tests, Mm -hmm. but apparently the learning curve was too much. And they were like, nah, we're not going to do it just yet. And it wasn't until like Peter Jackson and all those guys started like embracing red cameras and shooting stuff uh, that they did with the red and then the the red epics and all that stuff that, but when Aerie came in, they literally made the housing of those cameras like a film camera with the buttons all in the right spots. And that helped these guys get to the next level that were not digital filmmakers. Well, also the, the problem with red and I shot a few projects with the red one when it was in its heyday, when it first came out and the problem with it was it would just crash on you randomly and it would take for, it'd take like two or three minutes to boot up. And then Sometimes when it boot up, there'd be something weird with it. Uh, and then it, sometimes it would just lock up on you in the middle of a take. You're just recording and then you're like, up, oh, up, oh, sorry, hold up. And like, that sucks when you've got to tell the director and the <laughs> actors like, yeah, everything you did was great, but we lost it because the camera just froze up on us. So that made a lot. And then Ari is like just the mo- one of the most respected names in the film business. Yeah business. And, and, so- and honestly, I think like if you crack open the Ari, you'll find all the red technology in there. Well, they did it a little differently. They, I mean, because I did, I remember reading tons of articles about it when it came out, and it was, it was using a 4K sensor to, it gets super technical, but it was, it's definitely, they did it a different way than, Red was throwing more like resolution at the problem, whereas Ari was kind of doing it, I'm trying not to get super technical and nerdy with it, but like the way they read the data was just slightly differently, and that's why when you... But, but, but there, I think there was, but there was a lawsuit because there was some proprietary stuff that was inside. I, I think, think it was the raw codec because that's where Red had everyone by the balls per se. It's because Red, the shooting raw was a problem because unless you could do compressed raw, it's a nightmare. The footage, the files are just too massive. So you needed compressed raw. And at the time, Red was the only one that had a compressed raw, you know, that was actually uh, efficient and you know, you didn't lose a ton of stuff. And I mean, it's still a nightmare to get it to do playback on a system unless you had one of their red rocket cards that were like five grand or something like that. But it's like, yeah, it was kind of a, that's what I think the, they were probably being sued for by Ari or Ari was getting sued for is because they might've been trying to dabble in with their, their raw compression tech, which I think there was a way around that with another one. And black magic's theirs is awesome. The one that they just came out with, but that's, that's a whole yeah that's a whole sorry (laughs) your eyes are glazing over you're like i don't no 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 (laughs) you know i i love all that stuff all the tech stuff yeah you know but that's why that's why it's good to always have you on here you know because uh 
we can talk about those things because there are going to be people that listen to the show and go, oh yeah, 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 yeah. He knows, yeah, he knows exactly what the hell he's talking well, about. Well, there, I mean, the I I'm not playing with the big boy cameras on that end anymore. So I mean, who knows what's? Up. I mean, I I see what's going on, and a lot of the the Ari just keeps making crazy cameras. Uh, Red seems like they've really matured. Now you're starting to see. I mean, I think Netflix. Sh- forever was shooting most of their stuff on red cameras because they could do uh well forever ari when it came out i think it was like 2k or 2.7k the R, the original ari alexa so it couldn't even like avengers was shot with the alexa and so that meant it wasn't even shot at 4k it was shot at like 2.7 so they had to up res to 4k so everyone watching avengers now that's not really i mean it's a up res of 2.7k and so that's why when Netflix was mandating everyone shoot 4K, so that's why they well, the red camera at the time was really the was only the, one was the only one. It. So and I think what did that what the Sony Venice that I just shot something on what was that? That's 6K. Yeah. That's 6K. Yeah, yeah. red. I think they're 8K and 6K now, and then that's why the Alexa. I think they've got a 6K camera out now or 8K or something like that. So yeah. everyone's got all the Ks. They all got all the Ks. Yeah. Boy, Net Netflix, I'll tell you what, since this COVID-19 thing, streaming's just been blowing up left and right. And, yeah. um, you know, HBO Max is finally getting ready to launch uh, May 27th. And I had HBO Now for a long time. Yeah. And, you know, the wife and I, we've got Hulu. We've got uh, Amazon Prime because she shops. Oh, the free shipping, and then we get all yeah. the television shows. Uh, yeah. And uh, so we got Amazon Prime, and we've got Netflix. And we have Spectrum Digital, so like we get 10 channels through Spectrum. Because here's the deal. Cable was like 150 160 bucks. So we were like, we're going to cut the cord, and then we'll just buy some apps and buy the the data, the you know, the the internet. But now we're almost up to $150 again. Yeah. So, and, and, and because of the baby, we got Disney plus. Right. And so Disney and uh, it's star Wars. It's, it holds its value as far as I'm concerned. Right. Um, and I'm still waiting for, uh, you know, Disney plus to add one more icon over, uh, and just have Lucasfilm mm-hmm. where we can get, you know, all the Indiana Jones films. Right. All this, right now they're all being rented to uh, Netflix. You can get all the Indiana Jones on Netflix. So, but HBO max is coming out May 27th. And, you know, they bought the whole library of friends, which my wife, you know, we binge watched them all before they got off Netflix because we, right. we both love friends. My mother, my wife more than I, I do. I mean, I like friends, but I had not watched all the episodes and she made me watch all the episodes. Yeah. Yeah. And then every, every Thanksgiving, we watch all the Thanksgiving episodes in the one day. Wow. That's what we do. That's cause <laughs> that's what you have to do. Right. Um, but they've got their own stuff coming out. And but I don't know if I want to go buy HBO max again. I don't see anything that's making me want to go. Ooh, ah, uh, Ooh, I got to get HBO max. What do you think about I now they did launch the Looney Tunes cartoons. They're doing all new Looney Tunes. Oh, really? Um, and they just had the trailer that came out for that the other day and it looked good. And the one thing I have to say is Bugs Bunny, they gave him the original yellow gloves that he had in the 1930s or whenever those cartoons first came out. He had yellow gloves. And I was like, oh, that's a good throwback. Only the hardcore fans who love Warner Brothers cartoons are gonna remember that Bugs Bunny had yellow gloves and not white gloves. Right. Um, so they got that going and they've got all the other stuff going, but I, I don't want to spend the 14 99 to get HBO max, even though they've got friends and some other things. I just, the whole libraries to me is not, what do you think, man? Are you going to get it? I I'll, so here's what I do at this point. The only thing I actually keep is Netflix and Hulu. And I rotate HBO and Showtime out as needed. And like, so when Billions comes on, I'll go to show, I'll get Showtime and watch Billions. And then, dude, I uh, love that show. It's so I love good. that show. And it's like, yeah. uh, and then with HBO too. And like, I don't have Showtime anymore, so I can't even see the new seasons getting ready to drop. Oh, is it? See, now I gotta, so what? Because they had as, a preview for it. As soon as Westworld's over, I'll, yeah, and that show's really gone downhill. The first season was so good. Second season just kind of I, was like, what's happening? And now, dude, the first the first season of Westworld, I barely got into it. It was it, it, was, it was so, so 
it was so hard oh, for me it, to you'd get hate into it. the newer because it's you can't even figure out what's going on half the time i mean yeah it's just they're trying to be too clever and it's it lost that magic i felt it, it had in the first season but anyway like i so what i do is and this is what's so great because i remember back in the day whenever you had cable when you wanted to get rid of hbo or showtime or cinemax you had to call up and be like hey i don't want this channel anymore and right. then they would like try to harass you into keeping it or offer you a deal and then they offer wouldn't you a deal then it wouldn't reflect until your next bill and if you just pass the thing then you got it for an extra month it was just it was a nightmare well now it's awesome like you just go into like i tend to get everything through hulu and uh you know like i got hbo and hulu right now and then when it's done i'll just cancel it and you can do it right in the app and it's awesome so i tend to only just have one sort of premium pay service at a time right and then i'll kind of binge all their shows that i haven't seen in a while and then rotate out kind of like that but netflix um yeah, I don't think I would get rid of them because they are pretty consistent with putting out new content all the time. And then Hulu, mostly now Hulu will be a hard one to decide whether to keep or not, because it seems like every major channel is just breaking off and doing their own thing. Like Peacock is going to be doing their own thing. And yeah, well, but it, but at least like, all right, for, my wife will never get rid of Hulu because she loves The Bachelor. Oh, yeah. And The Bachelorette. And, and I am forced to watch them. Is that ABC? Yeah, and that's yeah. owned by Disney. So Disney and, H- and Hulu, Hulu owns Disney. So that one hundred percent of it. That made me feel better when Disney kind of was like, "We're going to treat this as our R-rated or more mature content." Yeah, because I was yeah. kind of paranoid. I was like, "Oh man, all this cool stuff is going to disappear over there." So that's kind of cool, and I and I would like to see darker. Like for me, it's really hard to see a Wolverine without him being R-rated. Because in the comic books, he's the most R-rated dude there is. Like he's yeah. ripping people in half and chopping. Well, their heads I off. I, like, I have noticed that um, on uh, uh, Disney Plus they do or they are having disclaimers in front yeah. of some of the content. The older stuff. So yeah. the older stuff, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But going back to HBO Max, what is is there anything on HBO Max that's going to make you want to get HBO Max? I mean, it's something like. 10,000 hours of content. I mean, so you look, I already own all the lethal weapons, the good ones on DVD, yeah. like the stuff that, that, that is on is in the Warner brothers library is stuff that I already kind of have on Blu-ray and, and regular DVD. And I know it's regular DVD, but it it's free. It's sitting in my cabin. Right. Like, like I don't, there's, n- I mean, in friends, like my wife has them all on DVD. Right. I okay, think there's if we only... really want to, we can pop them in. There's only one thing right now that would get me to do the HBO Max, and that would be the Snyder oh, Cut of Justice Snyder League. Snyder Cut of Justice. I knew that was coming, the <laughs> Snyder Cut. I mean, it's not going to happen. They're not going to do it. It's like they're dumb if they do, if they have it all in a can somewhere that's mostly done. Because there is a huge, and that's what Zack Snyder on that on that that other like Facebook wannabe platform. Right. He's always, I think he's got money tied up in it, but he's always pushing his stuff out on that 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 uh platform he's always showing little clips and stuff and here's here's the joke okay right he had a couple of old canisters 35 millimeter reels that you splice together right and um had justice league snyder cut written on him or something but i i'm pretty damn sure they shot that digitally there'd be no reason to have <laughs> the cans uh, of film. Th- a 35 millimeter yeah. print cans of film from back in the day um yeah and, and i i don't know if he and here's the deal. That Justice League was supposed to be a two-part movie. Right. They spent $350 million making it. Then they had to go back and fix it. it. It was a $500 million price tag altogether with marketing and all that, all right. the bells and whistles. And it made $479 million at the box office. So it didn't even make the money back. That and even on Blu-ray and DVD, it didn't, it didn't make the money back. It was a yeah. complete flop for them, write it off. Although Warner Brothers. And here I, I'm going down the rabbit hole. I love these guys. They just broke off a nice check for me. But, <laughs> but they they have a tendency to have that really. They they claim like none of the Harry Potter films have ever made a dime, and like the last four of them made eight hundred and fifty million plus, you know. But then you you know when you look at the what was reported about the Star Wars movies right. um, today uh, today at Dark Horizons or it might have been yesterday, uh, they were reporting that like 
the solo movie actually turned a $77 million profit. That's crazy. But The Force Awakens that brought in $2 billion at the box office only netted Disney $780 million. After production costs and advertising. Production costs, advertising, tie-ins, all that right, kind right. of stuff. And same with the other ones. They were, they, they were showing how these movies, they spend so much money that they don't get the money back that we all think, oh, two billion of the box office. It's right. the greatest thing on earth. And it's like, no, nah, they only brought in 780 million, which is still a good chunk of change for the oh, mass yeah. house. But anyway, the Snyder cut, it's never going to be on HBO max. I, be, yeah, and the reason why is exactly what I was saying. They, they would have to spend money to right. finish it. Well, the problem They're is not going to do it. We don't know how much was actually finished. Because that's the thing, like that you never can get anyone to really say is. It seems like they went and did a, sh they showed it, they did a screening with Joss Whedon was there, and then of course because Avenger Joss Whedon had just come off Avengers and all this stuff, everyone's looking to him like, what do you think? They just got slammed because like this is where I everything's I had a, too dark. Well, this is where I had a problem with DC and that where they were just rushing too quick is. When Batman vs Superman came out and it was not well received, and then because it came out in March, and then that April they started shooting in Justice League, they should have hit pause big time on that. They should yeah, have been like, they, they Whoa. remember, remember, if they just start shooting in April, right? They were doing pre production for eight to ten months prior on Still, Justice though, League. It's, but they had spent all that money, so but to you them can, the green light, the it, green light was go. But to me, that's stupid because it's like clearly the direction that this guy's going isn't pleasing the fan base. So we should stop, push the date back, and then I and I know they were just worried. But like, now, oh. but now we have a Frankenstein monster oh, Justice League yeah. with the mustache contra Ugh, with all that. Oh, worse. that looks so bad. Yeah. And and there's deep fakes that are better on YouTube oh, yeah. than what whoever they sent that footage to to be corrected. Yeah. Completely botched the job. I they should who never knows work how again long in the industry. They had to do it too. I mean, who that's they, the, the scary thing. They could have had weeks and they yeah. they probably went the hard way instead of finding yeah. some cheap software they could have done it. Right. But the bottom line is they don't want to spend a dime on this movie to complete it. And and you know Josh Whedon did his thing on it, and they're just trying to get away from it all now. Well, I think, you know, I do think as much as I wasn't completely in love with Zack Snyder's style for this. After seeing after seeing what happened with Justice League, we all want to see what it could have been. Well, because it's like he clearly had like a vision, you know, so yeah. I kind of just want to see the guy's vision. And like the also I, I did watch the Batman versus Superman like extended version. And oh, that was good. I watched it too. That was really good. And I probably would have liked the movie. And I think a lot of people would have liked that movie more because it what needed they basically, those extra scenes. What they basically cut out was Superman, like, which gave you a lot of justification why he was pissed off at Batman, like, and why he was like looking as Batman as a threat that needed to be eliminated. There was a lot of, you know, exposition and backstory that why, what, what got Superman to that place. So, it was really dumb to cut all that out because in the end, it just looks like Superman's just kind of a whiny bitch. Who's but you know what? It, pro it, it would have been a three-hour film, probably. Well, how long was the the extended cut? It was like three hours. Like right, and right. and remember, they need to get five showings in a day at the cinema. Yeah, yeah. But you start doing that, and then you add twenty minutes worth of previews on the front. But of you each had one. to have you, known you're that. You're losing. Though. You're gonna no. They probably thought we were gonna. We'll put out the director's cut and and double dip. We'll put out the movie in the theater. Then we'll show them all the stuff yeah. that would have made the movie great. But that backfired because I mean the thing is, and it did backfire. Is why we would even let this guy who comes in with a movie that's gonna be three hours long. Like the script had to have been pretty massive, and his storyboards because I think Zack Snyder storyboards a lot. So it's like, and he shoots the damn thing himself. So I'm it's sure, a, and it's a, it's a single camera show. Like, or a single yeah. single camera film. He doesn't use multiple cameras. He puts wow. one on his shoulder and he does a lot of the, he does what James Cameron does. James right. Cameron will take a, the, the, I, I remember hearing, yeah. hearing stories on uh, uh, Titanic where the, 
the camera operators would be standing up against the wall eating crafty <laughs> because Cameron would take it off his shoulder, take it off their shoulder and put it on his shoulder and get in the water and start. Cause you know, you could tell somebody do it like this and make sure the camera yeah, yeah. goes this way. And if it's, but, but then he sees it in his mind a certain way and only I can capture it. And right, yeah. I get it. I get it. It's, it's a maniacal kind of process. Um, yeah. But same thing with Michael Bay does the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Totally you know? does. And who was it? Um, uh, I just watched a movie and um uh what's his name was the cinematographer but he had a fake name because he couldn't be in both guilds um Soderbergh Steven Soderbergh oh, really? was the cinematographer on a movie that just came out Really? Uh and he used a fake name. Hmm, I didn't know that. Be- because he wasn't allowed to the director's guild didn't allow him to be the cinematographer. Huh. No, I mean, so I think we'll sort of bring it back to Batman versus Superman or Justice League Snyder Cut. I do think, especially, I I definitely liked Batman versus Superman better when I did see the way it was meant to be seen. And I do feel like, I I don't think it'll be a great movie, but I do think it'll be a better movie because at least it'll be the guy's vision. And I might not agree with everything he does. He does usually have a really interesting vision you see what i'm saying right so I, but that I would be the only but that that would have been the only movie that would have got you to jump back into hbo max well i'll probably still jump in well if they lean hard into this is where they should be kind of doing what marvel's doing is because comic book characters are at their best when it's a serialized show like because that's how comic trying books to cram are. so much information in. Yeah, they're they're great one movie for just doesn't work. Endgame and Infinity War, where it's just not feasible on a budget to have all these characters in one film at one time. You know, you couldn't yeah. do that on yeah. a show realistically. Totally. But they should be taking, you know, characters and doing television runs with them because there's again a lot of great stories that are in the comic books that we hardly ever see on the screen. Uh, that they could be doing all this stuff. Like the Flash was probably the CW's m- most highest rated show, uh, especially in the beginning when it first came out. And it was because it one, it was an actual main character, not like you know the Green Arrow, who's kind of like Robin Hood essentially in the comic books. Right. Uh, you know he was, and he was clearly a lot of real comic book people didn't like that version because he was really more Batman than Batman. Right. Than, Trained without Ra's al Ghul. I mean, every yeah. Batman villain basically was right. in the mix on the CW with Arrow. And, and that was because they didn't have the television rights. Right. So uh, they were just, you could tell that was sort of a, a light uh, a Batman light uh, kind of thing. But the uh, Flash was really the Flash and he, they were doing real Flash storylines from the comic book, like, you know, Flashpoint and all this stuff. So, and the reverse Flash. And so, these were all great storylines. So like, that's what I don't get. If they would actually lean in and start really doing DC characters on their HBO max, I would be there all year long, but I, it seems like they have so little respect for the DC properties. That Although I you doubt did, you know, happen. you saw that JJ Abrams is going to be doing justice league dark for HBO max. Yeah. Is it an animated thing or is it no a movie live movie? action? Live action. Oh, I I did not hear that. So yeah, yeah. That and that's why Swamp Thing probably because my wife worked on Swamp Thing. She's a producer's right. assistant. That's probably why it got canceled. You know, they spent eighty four million dollars doing ten episodes. They actually um, were supposed to do fifteen episodes, I think, mm. or thirteen episodes. It was thirteen, and um, they pulled the plug on ten. They had writers for two weeks. Just they did a hiatus on the, on the last episode, yeah. let everybody write it off and finish it. Because I think that at that point, JJ had was in negotiations for his $500 million deal and bad robot wants, wanted to do their take on dark, the, the dark, the justice league dark. Yeah. It's weird. So, but you know, look, JJ Abrams always has his hand in everything. And with a $500 million deal, we'll see what he can do with it. But speaking of JJ Abrams, I just, I, and 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 the fact that now he's with Warner Brothers, I just want to pivot back to Lucasfilm. So, uh, the Disney Plus series that they're getting ready to announce, they the creator of um, Russian Doll, oh yeah, uh, is going to do a female centric Star Wars series. 
Now, we don't know if that's the Osaka Tana series mm-hmm. that they are going to set up in Mandalorian because, uh, you know, Rosario Dawson has been cast as Osaka Tana. She's going to be in the Mandalorian. We don't know what in what capacity, but are they going to spin her off into her own series? Um, now, but before we go down the rabbit hole of another female centric series, I just want to throw this out there that we've got the Obi-Wan Kenobi series coming down the pipe. Yeah. That's a ma- male lead. We've got, uh, uh, you know, you got your rogue one spinoff with Cassie and Andor male lead. Yeah. You've got the Mandalorian male lead. So everyone's flipping out because now there's going to be this female centric spinoff Disney plus series for star Wars. But 75% of the series that are being created that'll be on that Disney plus platform are male dominated. Yeah. So like, why are, why am I seeing people in the, in the, in the interweb world flipping out over this? Well, I, I was kind of like, I did a slight eye roll. Cause I just hate when they're like, Oh, we're going to do a female, all female, like all in on female kind of thing. Cause it's just like, just, Focus on good storytelling, and then if it happens to be a female, great. Then go down that well, road. May, but I do maybe, think may, that if it is that character, that makes a lot of sense. And I do oh, Sakatana, yeah, yeah. If it is that character, perfect sense because they say like it takes place in a different part of the galaxy, away from everything. Right. Why you won't haven't seen her in you know in any of the original trilogy or anything you know so that or actually the prequel films too because. Well, she was kind of going like that was the weird thing. It was she. I never watched the cartoon, but I it seems like doesn't she show up between Clone War and and Rebels? She's Rebels. in Rebels and Clone War, but no. In the, and as far as the canon films, so you had the second. What was the second movie called? At this, I can't remember. Attack of the Clones. Attack of the Clones, Clones. Yeah, and then you had Revenge of the Sith. Yeah. So it was the the. That show in between Attack of the Clones oh, dude, and Revenge of the Sith. If you haven't been watching uh, no. the new season seven of the Clone Wars, they've already launched two of the last four episodes, and they're all intertwined with Revenge of the Sith. Oh, so like cool. in the episode that premiered this morning, right. that I watched this morning, um, uh, Obi Wan Kenobi appears to her in a hologram, and she's like, "Where's Anakin Skywalker?" And he she, he says he's been dispatched to 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 go uh to to uh spy on the chancellor right. so there so these are conversations obi-wan was having filling in the gaps when you weren't when yeah. you weren't seeing him on screen in revenge of the sith he's talking to a sakatana so like all this stuff and darth maul's in it and you're and then it then it's going to roll in probably into the crimson crimson dawn which is in solo yeah. cuz maul was in that so they are setting up everything that's why i feel like oh sakatana if if she, if she's in these last four episodes have been all Osaka Tana uh, in Star Wars Rebels Clone Wars yeah. Clone Wars have been all centric to her and I think in the last episode you're gonna find out where she vanishes and goes to right which makes her come back around on the Mandalorian right. and then if she takes the baby Yoda which is not the Yoda it's the child because it's right. a it's a cl- clone right. if she takes the clone because in all the Star Wars Rebels and all the stuff, she was all best friends with all the clone army guys that when they had the helmets off, they all have their different names. And right, everything. yeah, yeah. And they love her. She, in, the, in the Clone Wars, they gave her her own troop of guys with uh, their helmets had the face paint that looked like hers right. in the, the la- these last couple of episodes. And so I, I really, I think what, what, again, it's like they led with a headline, female-centric. Right. And somebody's leading with a headline that's just to get people fired up. Yeah. When it should press. just be we're launching another series about Osaka Tana. If they had yeah. led with that title, everybody would have been like, "Wow!" Ah! But when you yeah. start, and then they 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 prefaced it with a picture of Kathleen Kennedy and a couple of girls saying the force is female on yeah. all their shirts. That just got all these guys riled up. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah, they're yeah. doing it again. They haven't learned their lesson. <laughs> you know, I mean, like, and I'm just going, 
if it's Osaka Tana, that shit, because then it's Rosaria Dawson. She's going to do the yeah. series. She'll have the double lightsabers going. You know, she's, oh, dude, it's going to be badass. No, I, I think that's a smart move. I, I think they should absolutely do that if that's the case. Or a Cara Dune sh- series. I would, I loved uh, Gina Carano as Cara Dune. I would absolutely watch her as her own series outside of the Mandalorian. So, uh, dude, it, dude, back, back in the day, I would have eaten her up with like candy. She was, she's gorgeous to look at and she can you know? beat the mess out of you. And she <laughs> did an MMA fighter. She, she was in Hay- Haywire. Wasn't that a Soderbergh? Yes. Movie? Oh, that was such dude, a good movie. She was so good in that movie. She's oh so God. good, but no, yeah, she's, she's like a she's legit, hot. she's a legit badass. Like she was I know, a badass I know. MMA she, fighter. So like, yeah. that's what was great about Haywire. She did all of that. So, yeah. Um, so great. I but, would but, totally watch a series with just her as the Cara Dune character. I well, and the, and, awesome. and but and then they they said that uh, the they already started writing the Mandalorian season three, mm-hmm. and they've already started doing pre production on season three, doing the artwork and everything for it, um, and that that is going to go a total of twenty four episodes, eight episodes a season. So we know it's going to end, but it they said in season three they will be spinning off other shows, which again. When you start saying spinning off and you bring Osaka Tana yeah. in and then you're talking about a female led series. That makes sense. It's a no brainer, man. Yeah. It's a no brainer. Yeah. I, I you're probably hundred percent right. I, that's probably what it will be. So I'm excited about that. But I still don't think I'm gonna buy HBO Max. I I'll get it as uh when I mean God, honestly though. I'm not sure. At this point, I'm kind of over Westworld. I'll kind of finish this season. It's not really anything I might want to go back to. And now that Game of Thrones is over, there's really nothing left on HBO. Well, I mean, and they got the prequel of Game of Thrones coming out. It won't be. But I'll be honest with you, who gives a shit? Because it's like it'll it's happening a thousand years yeah. before Khaleesi and all that but we already know what the end is Khaleesi right. gets stabbed like I don't need to see a thousand year old Tarakian or whatever what do they call them the Darth uh, Raki or whatever Darth, Darth Raki. Raki. I don't yeah. need to see none of that shit from a thousand years ago I just don't I uh, I think the way it ended just frustrated so many people they yes probably will be like oh, pass you know and that's like the same thing with with, with Goodfellas like I I'm I was done with that last season of Good, not Goodfellas. I'm sorry, Sopranos. The last yeah. season of Sopranos, the last couple episodes just kind of blew. And you know, now they got the 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 Saints of uh, Newark mm. that's coming out, which is a prequel, which is uh, the uncle. Oh, really? It's a movie, and they got they got James Gandolfini's son to play, to play him. a young Tony, and he looks like him, sounds like him. Wow, it's scary. But he did have to audition for it too. Yeah, yeah. like they made him audition. Uh, but but he talked. To, I mean, he's got the whole voice. He's got it. I mean, it's crazy, dude. He that's sounds wild. and he looks like him. Well, his real son. That's pretty awesome. It's crazy that they're doing that. The but I don't know if I want to see what. Yeah. Uncle, what was the uncle's name? I don't. I never watched Sopranos. So. <laughs> oh my god, the first couple of seasons are just yeah dynamite. But. Yeah. Well. And there's one thing I do want to bring up that with all these shows, like when you talked about the Mandalorian doing eight episode seasons, I love all this digital, you know, world we live in now where all these, there's so much content being done, but I hate these really short eight episode seasons. And I wouldn't mind it so much if they had stuff to follow up after with other content that was sort of in the same vein. Cause like the thing is, I'm just, I guess I'm just so used to growing up where you had, Almost 22 episodes. Months. Yeah, 22 yeah. episodes yeah. of television to watch once a week. And so now, even when you do like HBO, pretty much everyone but Netflix releases them once a week, you know? So, but they're all so short. Like everything that's being done is like uh, eight episodes. And that's something too that uh, frustrated me with Picard, the Star Trek Picard series, is it was a great, it depends on who you ask. Like a lot of people that love I still haven't the next seen generation. It. Like the, a lot of the diehard next generation people, I get why they don't like it. I did like it uh, only because it was a, a little bit of fan service. Like you get to see some, you know, old favorite characters and in some cool moments. Um, but I hated that it was so short because Star Trek, because I've been sort of during the COVID in my spare time, I've been binging through the old next gen uh, series 
and I love that they're very, and that was one of the great things about Star Trek that it was sort of movie of the week, and you right. could have an arc for but the I, season, and it carried but I, out. I, I do think that there's so much going on behind the scenes with CBS and Viacom and Paramount yeah. and the rights going back and this, that, and they couldn't, they, they haven't made any money off Picard or off discovery. Um, I they, read that they, article. Be, yeah, yeah. And you know, they're, they've been struggling with it because, um, you know, they can't merchandise off of it. They can't make toys cause they, they had to get everything under the house again. And, and, and CBS all access has been a bust. Yeah. Well, they keep raising the for, prices. <laughs> no, no, but like with everyone else coming out with their stuff with more th- th- and, and, you know, there's talk that the, the Star Trek m- franchise might be sold off just to save Viacom and CBS's ass. Uh, they, they might sell that off. If Disney bought that game changer. I mean, again, they would just own everything. It, like, yeah. I don't know why Warner brothers wouldn't buy that to at least have something to sort of be there. Compete. Because that's sort of what got the well, original movies made. But that's what they're made, that's was... what they're hoping Dune is going to be. Their Star Wars, Warner Brothers. Oh, that's why they I dumped a that. ton of money. They got the guy who directed Blade Runner, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, to do the new Dune, and that is what they're banking on to be their Star Wars. But just and I don't out- think it's going to happen because even the original Dune sucked. Well, just outside of like Star Wars, I was just using that as an example. But most of these shows are eight episodes, eight or, episodes, ten episodes. Know, yeah, I, and I think. 13 episodes always felt like the nice, like perfect amount. You know what I'm right. saying? Like the 13 episodes or 12 or 13 just always feels like that's a great, you don't feel like it's getting too long and you can tell like that. The problem I do have with, I don't really love 22 episodes a season because you can tell writers when they get are lazy, just trying to find get, stories. They're just, to yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. Dude, yeah. the later seasons of Smallville. Ugh, it was depressing because they were just throwing darts at a dartboard at every eighties movie and just trying to steal plot lines from that. I mean, it was bad, but you could tell like they, they had like an overall arc for the season, but they'd get to like, all right, for these next three episodes, we got nothing. So let's we got just... nothing. We, yeah. So we need to write. Filler. Let's, yeah. So they got a, they got a couple of filler episodes while the writer's room is going to try to figure out what to do the rest of right. the season. So I'm, no, I'm dude, okay I get that. with a boiled down 13 episode season, but I just hate how everyone needs to make it all epic. Like, and I get they're doing it as eight episodes so they can have a higher budget and do all right. this. But I'm like, and again, with Star Wars, or I mean, not Star Wars, Star Trek, I like next gen outside of, you know, some hokey appliances and some you know hokey cg that they had to work with back then it still holds up because the performances are really good like uh, uh patrick stewart is amazing like watching that it's just you don't even it's like funny because when i remember that the time period it came out with and what was on tv it's so that it was so corny back then and then when you look right. at star trek it still holds up because you're like it's, yeah you know out of time in a way so it's like this great thing. And they're able to pull, even if let's say you did star Trek the way it was done originally and just did updated CGI and all the places they did, you could still do that today. And people would still like it. I would think granted young well, kids. Well, they, they actually did go back to the original sixties star Trek and redid all the special effects for the blu-ray. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they did, did do yeah. that. You know, they updated it, but I would say this, like I, I haven't watched Picard yet. I've watched clips of all the like money scenes with yeah. you know Riker and 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 Data and all that stuff. But I haven't committed to watching the whole thing because I did watch a video that was a compilation of all the the F bombs that are dropped and the yeah, cursing yeah. and stuff that they do. And then it referenced back to my favorite Star Trek film of all time, Star Trek The Voyage Home, which is when they went and brought the whales back from yeah, the twentieth yeah. century. And you know, they were on that city bus and Spock was sitting there and the guy the punk rocker was there and he starts cursing at them. And, uh, uh, Kirk says something like, Oh, in the 20th century, you know, they use slang, you know, uh, and he cursed. He says, but we don't use that language anymore. Cause in the 21st century, 250 years in the future. And so for all of a sudden, everybody on star Trek discovery to be dropping F bombs and, yeah, and yeah. things like that. To me, it was like, it, it was turning its back on what was established that because the whole thing about star Trek is it was, it's not supposed to be in shambles, like how everything is now. Right. Um, 
you know, they, they didn't have money anymore uh, because they didn't need it. People right. did jobs because it fulfilled them. It was like yeah. they had replicators, so nobody ever went hungry. And like the whole world just, you know, there was a civil war and then the Federation was formed. And then that's how everything came together once the warp drive was created. And so not to get too trekky, but I, they've turned their backs on a lot of what, and that's why I haven't committed to it yet because I still love my, uh, Star Trek generations and, 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 you know, the first contact and insurrection yeah, yeah. because they all, they all felt, they all still were the Federation is a good thing. Yeah, it's yeah, trying yeah. to bet. Right. And I just, when they start ripping it all apart, just to rip it apart uh, and they make our heroes like they did with Luke Skywalker into just a shitty asshole from the hero that he was. Same thing they're doing. They, they, it's like for some reason there's this generation of filmmakers that feel they need to come in, rip everything down, yeah. make all the characters shit, and then go in a whole nother direction. And I just I can't wrap my head around that. And I want to watch Discovery and I want to watch Picard, but at the same time I love what I have. And right. I don't want to be jaded like I have been with some of the Star Wars films and go, the, my characters have changed. Yeah. You know? I will say I now looking back at especially watching Next Gen and then looking back at Picard, it definitely doesn't feel like Star Trek. I mean, I and the only yeah. moments I really enjoy it are when the original characters are characters back. come back. Right. Um, and that's what I dig about it. And I, the effects are cool and the things they can do now are awesome. But it is true. Like the thing that Star Trek has always tackled social issues. They just yes. did it in a really clever way with other, like with aliens to demonstrate those things. And you it can't was never be racist towards this one. Because... Right. But it did it in a really good way where it wasn't just, and like now it's like so lazy. It's like lazy and it's just, you're wearing it on your sleeve, you know? And that's just, right. you're, you're taking right. the, the interesting story out. Like, cause when it's just, when you're not bringing it into the real world and it's just sort of air, you can kind of see the flaw in logic to certain people's arguments. Cause it's when you look at it out of context or, you know, in a different context, you're like, Oh yeah, I could see why that person would be considered an asshole, you know, or whatever when yeah. you look at it. And so like, that was the beauty of it. You could tell, you could tackle a lot of crazy issues that were, you know, really hard to talk about, especially back then in the sixties and then even in the nineties or eight late eighties and nineties, in a way that was really clever and smart. And now yeah, did it's you just... get to, did, did you get to that episode in next generation where they found the, the orbiting like a uh, satellite that was just, and then it wind up having cryo freeze people on it that they thawed them out and they were 250 years into the future. And the, the one guy yet. was like an oil, he was an oil baron and he was like, I, I, I want did. my money from yes. Texas. But, yeah, I and they were saying, one. well, we don't really have these things anymore. We don't do this. Right. Well, how am I supposed to be the wealthy man that I am before? And it's like, again, they talked about all these social issues, but in a clever way and saying, look, it's, you know, you know, if you want to hit utopia, right, you got to change how we do things. Right. The construct. Yeah. So I think that's and, the, and, but they're just doing it lazy now. Well, it's and, just it's it's like to me it's lazy and it's just you're wearing it on your sleeve and so checking boxes. Yeah, it, now it just seems more talking at you than engaging you to think for yourself and be like and make come to that discovery on your own through great storytelling. Right. And so like that's the thing that I so now when I look at it, I'm like it really wasn't it's like, that good. It's like here, here, kid. Here's your spoonful right. of Star yeah. Trek. Take it, take it. I'm spoon feeding you all the information. I don't want you to think for yourself. Here, <laughs> that's yeah. racism. Here, yeah, right. That's sexism. Right. Here, yeah, I get it. Just spoon feeding, I, dude. I'm with you, man. Like, where is the real good writing that makes people engage? Yeah. Um, that's but on a that note, man, dude. How this has been a great episode too. Yeah. No, nah, this has been um, good. Of the podcast, so I'm excited. I love that we go off on tangents, but it's still kind of structured. Yeah, loosely. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, I look forward, my friends, too, to seeing you on the next one. All right, man. Thanks for having me. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Spotlight with Sean O'Rourke. Uh, and uh, make sure you subscribe to the channel if, this, if you're a YouTube uh, viewer. Uh, check out all my social media. They'll all be in the description in the comments below. 
Uh, you can check me out on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and all those cool places. And uh, be sure also to go to Anchor. And uh, if you want the audio portion of this and subscribe there, this way you can get updated with all the new episodes when they come out every week. It'll be fun. You'll enjoy it. We'll see you.